A man is never disturbed for any of these domestic petty things. He doesn't know where the grocery comes from. He doesn't know where the milkman comes from, how much milk is to be taken, where does the paper come from to the house. He doesn't even know where his children go to, in what school or in what class, because he is so engrossed in writing. But is it the same if the woman is writing? Whether it is day or night, the man is not disturbed if he is a writer. And whenever his mood is, he comes out of his room and maybe he is available for the others. But otherwise, he is engrossed in his own writing, sitting in his own room because he has a own room for himself. But if a mother is writing or if a woman is writing, do you think that the same room is available to her? There is nothing like a woman's room. There is nothing like a mother's room in any of the houses constructed, till date at least. And a woman has to find some place in order to keep her stationery, papers, pens for writing. Do all the domestic chores at the respective times. Keep everybody in the house at their full humor. And if chance is there, if some time is there, and she is not disturbed by any of these guests in the house, then she would open up her papers and write. And if anybody comes in between, she has to have a smile and put it away and then attend to them. Yes or no? If such freedom is lacked for a woman to write and she doesn't have a room of her own at all, papers to write on, pen to write on, then how do you think, how do you think that Milton's and Shakespeare's be produced by, from women? The question that existed in Mary Wollstone's craft condition is that education should be given to women because women in the Western world were not educated then. And by the time it is 1792 to almost 1929, some 200 years in between, yes, things have much changed and all girls were educated in the Western world. But the problem with Virginia Woolf that she has raised in a room of one's own is, is she free enough to utilize the certification of the education that she has got, earn money and spend the money on her own? Not really, because Virginia Woolf herself, as we look into the biography of her, was not free enough to take her salary and spend on her. Her father was very dominant in taking away the money. So she wanted a room of one's own where her money her hard-earned money can be utilized in constructing the room, in getting the stationery, in getting the paper and pen and sitting at a peaceful way to write something so that Milton's and Shakespeare's can be produced even from the woman's world. There is a point in what she says. Yes, sir. The next interesting writer that we find in the history of feminism is Simone de Beauvoir, belonging to France. She has come out with a beautiful book called The Second Sex in 1949. Virginia Woolf's text is in 1929 and in these 20-30 years, the Western world has quite changed, where the women is not only educated, but also were careerists and started earning their own money. The problem of Virginia Woolf is not the problem of Simain de Beauvoir, but Simain de Beauvoir in her second sex brings about some new problem, that now in 1949 or 1950s, you could find women who are educated and employed. She gives a number of examples in her book to explain how still inequality exists between a man and a woman. One of the beautiful examples suggested by Simone de Beauvoir is if the man as well as woman, the wife and the husband, both are of equal qualification, equal ranking, equal position in a particular office in different sections, drawing equal salary. Just examine the one day's routine of the man and the woman of such sort. The woman right from the beginning, maybe early hours of the morning, gets up, does the domestic chores, take care, takes care of the children, then takes care of the breakfast and the lunches of both the man and the woman. And then the man gets up in a very leisurely way, gets himself ready and then goes to the office. Both of them go to the same office at the same time, work for the same time with equal pressures and while coming back, she again takes care of all the domestic chores and children and so on. Whereas a man after the office goes off to the club to relax himself because he is too exhausted in the office. While you could find the woman doing all the domestic chores, taking care of the dinner, taking care of the children, taking care of the home assignments of children, putting them to sleep and then having food, cleaning again and then sleeping. 
and then lying on the bed whereas the man comes off from the club ha- relaxes a bit and then has his dinner and sleeps off if you look at the routine of one day you could find so much of discrepancy rather if the man and the woman are working and they come back from the office at the same time the woman the door is unlocked it is the woman who goes into the kitchen to get the cup of tea for the man and never vice versa all these discrepancies and all these differences have been brought about by simain de bova so very beautifully and delicately in her book the second sex which actually was the problem then in the 1950s kate millet's very beautiful text sexual politics that she published in 1983 is again another seminal text to bring about this distinction between man and woman toril moy sexual and textual politics it's not only the sexual politics at home but it's a textual politics also that has been maintained because even if you want to publish something a man's publication is always faster when compared to women and even in the texts also the women are always undermined and are given a secondary status never the primary status as suggested by toril moy Anne Shaw Walter from America a literature of their own that she has written in 1977 is a beautiful text that talks about various differences that we will be also talking about in this video Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gilbert these two have written a very excellent text called the mad woman on the attic in 1979 commenting upon how the woman is made mad because of the over domination in the patriarchal society Julia Kristeva a psychologist from France has come out with a creature feminine is a beautiful word that she has coined in the system and the speaking subject Helen Sixou again a fem- again a feminist from France writes Sorties and the laugh of Medusa in 1976 to bring about the same discrimination between man and woman in the existing society <laughs> Helen Shaw Walter in her text which is titled as a literature of their own that she published in 1977 talks about three phases of feministic development across the world the first is called as the feminine phase which is between 1840 and 1880 in the west i emphasize that all these movements belong to the west never applied to india remember the feminine phase which is the first phase from 1840 to 1880 she says that the women writers imitated the male writers and the artistic forms and their aesthetic standards and every woman tried to write like a woman write like a male write like a man only the words are of the woman but the entire text or the plot and the plot construction and the domination are all as we see in the society in the patriarchal form so the women try to imitate the males in the first phase Then we come down to the second phase which is called feminist phase which is between 1880 and 1920 feminist phase is a radical and separatist position that is made given to the woman so they start thinking to write like a man a woman will write like a woman whatever she feels like to write why should she imitate the man in writing is the next question so she is radical she is separatist so she wanted to separate from the male type of writing and she wanted to have her own type of writing and this is the second phase which is called feminist phase the third phase is called as the female phase which is from 1920 till date and the female writing and the female experiences however bad they are however good they are however oppressive they are have come out in the true reality in the female phase so the real phase of feminism is a female phase from 1920 till date it is elaine show walter for the first time has coined these words of feminine phase female phase and feminist phase Ellen Shaw Walter also talks about gynocriticism in her book. Gynocriticism is the historical study of women writers as a distinct literary tradition apart from the male writers. So you have separate papers as you could see even today in the BA second year level we have a uh, women literature women's literature or women's writing a separate paper where only women are being prescribed not as a counterpart of male So gynocriticism is the historical study of women writers as a distinct literary tradition. Alain Shaw Walter coined this time this particular term in her essay Toward a Feminist Politics. It refers to a criticism that constructs a female framework for the analysis of women's literature to develop new models based on the study of female experience rather than to adapt male models and their theories. And she uh, very beautifully in that book 
uh, which is called as um, towards a feminist po poetics says that uh, what exactly a woman's feelings are or women's literature should have or a woman's framework would be or what exactly is a female experience as such can be experienced only by people on an island who are brought about on that island right from their childhood when they are exposed only to women. So all girl children from the normal society will be taken out to into an island where the only mothers will be present. The hospitals are managed by female doctors and nurses who are female. The offices will be managed by female managers and female clerks. The banks will be managed by only women. The administration will be only women. The business time will be done only by women. So for the children who are growing up on that island, they don't know what men are and they don't know what this patriarchal domination is. To such a category of, you know, group of uh, women, then you would understand what exactly the female experience is and what they want. So it's, it's a wonderful experiment um, in spite of the fact that the... Um, Cart of life would require both the wheels, the ma male as well as the female. It was an experiment that was done by Ellen Show Walter and coined the term gynocriticism to understand the female experience in totality by negating the male models and male theories and male dominated society. The work of gynocriticism has been criticized by recent feminists for bringing for being essentialist, following too closely along the lines of Sigmund Freud and neocriticism and leaving out lesbians and women of color. If we slightly look into the history of this feminism, the feminists and scholars have divided the movements of history of feminism into three ways. The very first wave refers mainly to the women's suffrage. Suffrage would mean right to vote. So the first wave is always related to the basic uh, rights to women. Uh, women's suffrage movements of the 19th century and early 20th centuries mainly concerned with the right to vote, right to education and so on. The second wave refers to the ideas and actions associated with women's liberation movement beginning in the 1960s which campaigned for legal and social equality of women in the society, both in the domestic circles and in the working places. The third wave refers to the continuation of and a reaction to the perceived failures of second wave feminism beginning from the 1990s till date. So whatever rules we are getting, whatever acts are being followed, whatever uh, legal documents we are getting in order to safeguard the women's rights in the recent times in India as well as abroad all belong to the third wave. So we are all the products of the third wave feminism. Feminist criticism and the role of theory, if you observe, it can have three different criticisms. One is the American, the other is the British and the third is the French because it is in these places in Europe and America that feminism as a theory has developed. Remember, never in India. So the first is American feminism believes in the expression of women. The American feminist criticism talks about the theme, motive and characterization. They are skeptical about the recent critical theories. The treatment of literature as a representation of women's lives and experience are emphasized by the American feminism. Feminist criticism is a reading and explication of individual literary texts by women. American feminism is more a liberal feminist or humanist approach to literature. Ellen Walter, Sandra Gilbert, Susan Gibber, Patricia Stubbs, Rachel Brownstein are all the representative American feminist writers. The second wave or the second theory is the British feminism. British feminism believes in the oppression of women. American criticism believes in the expression of women. Whereas the British feminism believes in the oppression of women. The English feminist criticism is more socialist feminist in orientation and aligned with cultural materialism or Marxism. Obviously, it becomes a part of theory to form a Marxist feminist group. In Marxism, the rich and the poor distinction is there. In feminism, the male and the female distinction is there. So, female in general belonging to the poor because she is not an earning member and male in general being the earning member, upper class and the lower class automatically come and hence you have a Marxist feminist group. K.K. Ruthven's Feminist Literary Studies and Introduction that she published in 1984 
or Toril Moy's Sexual and Textual Politics of 1985, Julia Schwindel's Victorian Writing and Working Women in 1986, Cora Kaplan's Sea Changes, Culture and Feminism, published in 1869, na, sorry, 1986, and Terry Lovell's Consuming Fiction in 1987 are the very Seminal texts expressing the oppressive women from the British feminism point of view. The third is what is called as the French feminism. If the American feminism believes in expression of women, the British feminism believes in the oppression of women, the French feminism believes in the repression of women. Oppression, expression, repression. Got it? American is always for expression. British is always for suppression. And French is always for repression of women. The French feminists and feminism is very much theoretical. Starting with the French post-structuralists post like Lacan, Foucault and Derrida, from them literature is not expressing the personal experience of women, but they write about language, representation and psychology. Though the treatment of major philosophical issues before coming to the literary text itself, Julia Kristeva's The System and the Speaking Subject, published in 1975, is a seminal text in the French feminism. Because she brings out a new concept of a creature feminine, almost similar to that of gynocriticism of Ellen Showalter in America. Helen C. Sue's Sorties and the Laugh of the Medusa also explain the condition of women and the repression of women in the West. Lucy Irigari's The Sex, which has not published in 1985, is again another seminal text talking about the repression of women in France. Whether or not there exists a language which is inherently feminine is a general question because language is common to male and female and whatever language a woman uses in writing is exactly the same as man uses in writing. So in what way a woman can come out with her own language? If you want to express your own suffering which a man can never experience in the patriarchal society, you should have your own language is what Ellen Walter also emphasizes, is what... Um, Julia Kristeva also talks about. So it's very difficult to come out with your own language. Virginia Woolf in a room of one's own in 1929 says that the language used is gendered. It's God is always a he. Man is the example. Even if you want to give an example for human beings in general, it's always a man, never a woman. So from then onwards, Slightly linguistically speaking, a change has been observed. He or she has been put or it has been put, not he. Man or woman is put, not man. So God can be a man or a woman then. So all these are petty things, but still there is a common sentence ready for her use also. It's always has been a man's language and a man's sentence which cannot express a woman's inner self, according to many critics. Charlotte Bronte, Emily Bronte, Jane Austen tried the language and failed to express themselves because language essentially falls short in explaining the trauma or the suffering or the repression and suppression that a woman experienced in the patriarchal society because man cannot think of these words at all as he has never experienced it. So they fail to uh, express themselves using the language of man. Language essentially is masculine according to them. Dale Spender, in her book Man-Made Language, published in 1981, talks about that language is essentially patriarchal. Sandra Gilbert and Susan Guber in Sexual Linguistics, Gender, Language and Sexuality, published in 1989, oppose the patriarchal language that is used by man because it is man who has constructed this language and the language falls short of expressing the female experience. Feminine a creature is the term that is coined by Julia Kristeva. The language of the women is what is required by the feminists today. Female children at a land with females with no male domination at all developed a creature feminine, according to Julia Kristeva, semiotically, syntactically and semantically, which is quite difficult, but can be possible. Simple in outline but complex in its nuance, feminist criticism also is associated with psychoanalysis. Simaind Bhuva in her second sex in 1949 says, one is not born a woman. Rather, one becomes a woman. The word becomes is very interesting over here. Nobody is born but becomes. 
Kate Millett in Sexual Politics 1969 condemns Freud for his patriarchal attitudes against which feminists must fight. Gender roles must be changeable and malleable, but not inevitable and unchangeable, according to the feminists. Lacan and others, later by Julia Kristeva, also tried to reconsider Freud by considering the examples like Puthering Heights by Emily Bronte and others. So, feminism is a collaboration of movements aimed at defining, establishing and defending equal political, economic and social rights and equal opportunities for women. Its concepts overlap with those of women's rights definitely, but feminism is mainly focused on the women's issues. But because feminism seeks gender equality, some feminists argue that men's liberation is therefore a necessary part of feminism and that men are also harmed by sexism and gender roles. Feminists, that is persons practicing feminism, can be persons of either sex. The topics that are dealt by the feminists would be mostly about the women's body, the class, the work, the disability, the family, globalization, human rights, popular culture, race and racism, reproduction, science, the self, sex work, sexuality, equality and so on and so forth. I hope you have enjoyed the basic concepts of feminism through this talk. Bye for now.